Welcome back to Chud's Barbecue, everybody. My name is Bradley Robinson, and today I'm gonna give you my top five tips for the perfect brisket cook. Coming up! If you saw last week's video, I talked all about my five tips for how to trim a brisket like a true Texas pitmaster professional. We discussed the quality of meat you're looking for and how to really set yourself up for success when it comes to cooking a brisket by removing all the meat that's gonna burn up and any fat that's not gonna render and how to really give ourselves the best chance for brisket perfection. So now it's time to get that thing seasoned up, throw it on the pit, talk all about little tips and tricks you can do along the way to ensure that your brisket cook goes according to plan. So all that being said, that's what we're doing today and it is going to be smoky. This is our brisket. This is the brisket we trimmed up in last week's video. Looking pretty good, nice shape to a good amount of fat cap on there, nice and aerodynamic. Not the best brisket I've ever seen. It's kind of thick in the middle, it might ball up a little bit. And of course, we got this horrible gash on the back. Very unfortunate, but again, if this is the brisket I could find, then you're probably gonna find one just like it. So because this is already trimmed up, we don't really need to do anything to it, except to talk about our rub. When it comes to brisket rubs, you can pretty much do whatever you want, but Texas tradition dictates that salt and pepper is all you need, and I'm a wholehearted believer in that. Especially if you're new to cooking brisket, I highly recommend just starting out with salt and pepper to reduce the amount of variables you have going into it. And once you have your cook down and your bark where you like it, then you can start playing around with more flavors like seasoned salts or paprika, garlic powder, that kind of stuff. But you want to be careful because the more powdery ingredients you add, the more cakey the rub's going to get. And you may end up creating a barrier that's going to make it harder for the smoke and the salt to penetrate the meat. Because at the end of the day, that's really what we're after, is the salt to add great flavor and the pepper to be there to have a wonderful bark. And also after a 12, 15, 24 hour cook, the nuances of onion powder really aren't going to shine through as much as you may think. So today we're going with just salt and pepper. Kosher salt is what you're after when cooking a brisket. It's got a bigger granule size than table salt, which is going to make it a lot easier from a visual perspective to not over salt your brisket and it's going to mix better with the pepper because it's roughly the same size as the pepper we're going to use pepper 16 mesh black pepper is the pepper of choice here in texas it's kind of a coarse table grind looking pepper again it's the same size as the salt for makes for a really great rub and this is pre-ground so it's not nearly as strong as fresh cracked and these two things is really all you need this is diamond crystal kosher salt as opposed to morton's they're very similar morton seems like it's got a little bit bigger granule sizes and it's got some anti-caking agents in it where this is just pure salt i've used both in the past I prefer diamond crystal, but again, just pick a salt, get used to it, learn how to use it, and you'll be a-okay. When it comes to ratios of salt to pepper, a lot of people like to do 50-50, equal parts salt to pepper, which does work well, but I have over-salted briskets using a 50-50 rub because you have to be a little bit sparing with it. And I've also found that you're not gonna get nearly as solid of a bark as if you use what I like to do, which is two parts 16 mesh black pepper, one, two, two one part diamond crystal kosher salt. The reason I like this is because we can go on as heavy as we want with this stuff, and we're never gonna over-salt the brisket. Also, having this extra pepper on there is really gonna help the bark formation. You'll see just a few hours into this cook with all this pepper on there, it's gonna start looking nice and barky. And it may seem like a lot of pepper going onto a brisket, but again, this is pre-ground pepper that's gonna be cooked at around 300 degrees for at least 12 hours. So all the spicy and fragrant notes are gonna dissipate and we're gonna be left with some wonderful flavor. A lot of people like to use slathers on their brisket to help the rub stick, but in my experience, I've done it a lot of different ways and I find it to be unnecessary. Especially with something like mustard, which is kind of the go-to slather around these parts. It can tend to cook onto the brisket and again, create that barrier we were talking about earlier, where it's gonna be more difficult for that salt and smoke to penetrate the meat. Oftentimes in the past too, if I put too thick of a mustard layer on here, it can kind of cook up and the bark will start flaking off towards the end of the cook, which is not what we're after. But if you trimmed your brisket several days in advance and it was starting to dry out a little bit, then a slather can always help. Honestly, I think it light mist of some water is probably your best bet. It's gonna make it tacky enough for the rub to stick and will eventually evaporate away, leaving just salt and pepper on your brisket. Oil is another great option. I like that because it's gonna help the bark out a little bit, kind of get you that crispy bark as it becomes one with the fat and kind of fries on top if you're cooking really hot. But nine times out of 10, I'm pulling one of these out of the cryo vac, giving it a trim and it's still nice and tacky. I can tell just by looking at this one, it's still nice and tacky and I don't think we're gonna have any problems with the rub falling off. So again, two parts CC mesh black pepper, one part diamond crystal kosher salt, and we are just gonna go on and hit this thing with a nice heavy coating. Starting on the back side, which is the meat side, that's in an effort to preserve our presentation side. Because when we flip this thing over, if the table is kind of moist from the underside of this meat, this rub may get smeared a little bit, which is fine on the underside because that's not really where the bark is that we're gonna be aiming for. But as I mentioned, because this is so pepper heavy, we can really get away with putting on as much as this thing will take. And we have no fear of this thing over salting. Rub sticks perfectly. 
Same deal on the top side, folks. Nice, heavy coating all the way around. And please, don't forget the sides. See, a lot of people forgetting their sides. Don't want to do that. Especially right here, that's where those burn ends are going to be. Want to make sure you have plenty of rub on there. Again, you can get away with putting a lot more rub on this thing with that two to one. Highly recommend it. Kind of a foolproof brisket rub. Pat it in. Don't want to rub it. Again, that'll mess up the presentation a little bit. And we'll get those sides. All right, y'all, that is my very long-winded tip number one. Stick with salt and pepper. Looking good to me. Let's fire up the pit. Shout out, Barbecue Dragon. Thanks for sending me this fan. Very convenient. Probably would help if I uh, flipped in the right direction. Tip number two is all about getting your fire started. I always recommend people starting out with a little bed of charcoal. And that's because throughout this cook, that coal bed is gonna be our main source of heat, while our wood is gonna be our main source of smoke, while also replenishing the coal bed. But starting out with a pile of lit charcoal is really gonna help those logs ignite immediately. I'm sure you can hear them crackling away back there. And you're gonna get a lot less dirty smoke right off the bat and get this thing up to consistent temps a lot quicker. So I got about a half chimney's worth of charcoal in there or so, and I threw in three really dense logs. And the reason I like to start out with dense logs is because the first four hours or so of this cook is when this brisket is really gonna absorb the most smoke flavor before that bark gets a little too crusty. So I like to rock it around 250 degrees, really nice and smoky for the first few hours, just to make sure we get enough smoke flavor on this brisket. And because cookers like mine are very convective and have a lot of airflow running through, you can cook a brisket on here and be left wanting more smoke flavor. So to address that, I recommend starting out with some denser logs in the early stages of your cook. And you don't need to be too afraid of dirty smoke, at least for the first few hours. But if you did it for the whole time, you definitely end up with an acrid brisket. So on the pit we go. Right in the middle here, we're going on fat cap up, point towards the fire, and we're just gonna shut her down. Let this thing come up to temp. Again, we're aiming for around 250 degrees and nice and smoky. So like I talk about in my fire management video for how to cook on an offset, when I'm putting wood on this thing, I'm really aiming for good heat and good convection and not too much smoldering. The way you get smoldering is if you were to take a log, a big flat log like this and just put it straight on top of the coals. You're not gonna have great airflow and that's how you're gonna get a lot of dirty smoke. So what I like to do is put one log on one side of the firebox and then another one or two at an angle like this. That way it's kind of smoldering on this side, giving us a lot of good smoke but right here there's an air gap between the coal and the log which is going to promote a lot of flame and a lot of great convection kind of the best of both worlds of heat and smoke but that being said in these early stages if you really want to get some extra smoke on your brisket you can just flip them both put them right on top and that's going to give you a lot of smoke but you might have a hard time maintaining temperatures like that from here on out we're just going to keep an eye on the temps and on the logs themselves and once they look like they're pretty toasted and about to break down that's when we're going to go in and throw in another log or two it's all about trying to predict how much heat we have left in a log before throwing another one so we don't have major temp swings. This video is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers fresh quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week and now has 30 dinner recipes to choose from every week which is the most choices of any meal kit. They also offer different cuisines like the new Mediterranean recipes which allow me to cook new and exciting foods that I likely wouldn't have otherwise. The best part about HelloFresh has got to be the convenience. Having all the ingredients in exact proportions shipped right to my door makes cooking weeknight meals so much faster than having to roam around the grocery store and then get everything prepped. Not to mention it's incredibly sustainable. Pre Portion ingredients mean less prep for you and less wasted food because it only sends you exactly what you need for the specific meal. HelloFresh is the first carbon neutral meal kit company and nearly all the packaging is recyclable. It also cuts down on your food waste by at least 25% compared to traditional grocery shopping. But most importantly, the food is delicious. This barbecue cheeseburger was incredibly good. So if you're in the market for some convenient hassle-free meals, head over to HelloFresh.com, use code CHUDSBBQ16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Again, link in the description. That's HelloFresh.com. Use code CHUDSBBQ16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Thank you, HelloFresh. Four hours into this cook, let's see how this here brisket is looking. Oh yeah, looking real nice. That heavy pepper rub, giving us that bark already after just four hours. Looking good. Little bit of pull up on that side, but not bad at all. That'll flatten itself back out. And yeah, I've been rocking right around 250 this whole time. Haven't done much at all. This is my first time lifting the lid. And that brings us to tip number three, which is keep it simple. You know, I've got no water in that water pan. I haven't done any spritzing. I don't plan on doing any spritzing. No fancy rub 
rubs or slathers, no blocking log. All those things are just not entirely necessary for a perfect brisket cook. Especially if you're a beginner to brisket, I highly recommend just keeping it as simple as possible. Again, to eliminate any and all variables so you can really just dial in your fire management, that smoke flavor you like, work on your trim, and see how your first cook goes. If you got edges that are really crispy and dried up, then maybe you want to start spritzing along the way. If it's cooking super unevenly, you may want to add a water pan. If that back end is getting really hit hard, you may want to add a blocking log. But it's just like trying your food before you add salt to it, you know what I mean? You want to see what you can actually cook with the bare minimum before you start adding other tips and tricks along the way, if you want to get the best results, in my opinion. So that being said, we're going to bump that temp up to about 275, between 275 and 300 for the next several hours until we get up to an internal temperature of 180 degrees. All right, this brisket has come up to an internal temp of about 180 degrees, and that is exactly where we want it. Because that means it's time to wrap this thing up. So basically what happens is when the brisket hits an internal temperature of about 160, 165, it enters the stall. You may have heard of it. And that's when the brisket is pushing out the majority of its water content. And much like us, we sweat to cool us off. The same thing is happening to that brisket. The water is evaporating out of that brisket, causing evaporative cooling, which is why around 160, 170 degrees, the brisket seems to not want to rise up in temperature. But once it's done pushing out all that moisture, it's going to start rising really quickly. And that's when we want to wrap it up. Because if we wrap it too soon, we're going to collect all of that moisture in our wrap, and it's going to steam the brisket and start braising it, and that's going to be no good. And if we wait too long to wrap it, it might just get too crispy, and that lean end might get a little too toasted. And when it comes to brisket wrapping options, there are several options. Starting with the old Texas crutch, the full foil wrap. And this is by far the fastest way to finish off a brisket. You're basically putting the brisket in a little foil oven inside of a smoky oven. So it's going to cook really quick. The foil is going to conduct a lot more heat. It's also going to trap in all that steam and any residual juices coming out of that thing. So it's going to be braising from the bottom, steaming from the top, and it's a really quick way to finish off a brisket. The only problem is all that steam can really mess up your bark and you might end up with a pot roasty flavor from all the liquid in the bottom. But that can be solved by wrap number two. Butcher paper, probably the most popular way to finish a brisket. It works really well, especially for beginners, because it's going to help soften up all those crusty edges. It's going to give you that really nice buttery soft bark that a lot of people are after. It's going to hold in some fat and steam and juices, but because it's breathable and absorbent, some of the steam can escape, yet you're still going to have that fat inside the wrap, which is going to help kind of confit this thing. Really great way to go about doing things. The only problem is you can't really get a good feel for your brisket, because it takes a while to know how tender a brisket feels through a bunch of butcher paper. And then lastly, you've got the foil boat mat. Method, which is my favorite way to cook a brisket and that's where you only wrap the bottom side of the brisket leaving the top exposed and that's great because you get the best of all these options meaning all the crispy edges that would be softened by a full wrap of either foil or paper you're going to get with a foil boat it's going to cook a lot quicker just like a full foil wrap but because it's only wrapped on the bottom side all that steam can escape yet all the fat rendering out of that thing will be collected in the bottom and that's exactly what you want because the bottom is where the toughest meat is that's 100 lean on the underside of a brisket so having some fat kind of cone feeing and holding in there is going to give you some really tender bites. But most importantly with a foil boat, the fat cap is exposed for the entire time, which is great in so many ways. One, you're going to continue to render that fat cap down. Two, you're going to get some extra smoke on your brisket. Three, you can actually see what you're doing. You know, you can pick that brisket up, flip it around, give it a feel, look at it, probe it. You can add some finishing spritzes if that's your style. It's going to cook quicker, tenderize that bottom side, protect your edges, and give you some nifty little handles to pick that thing up and walk around with it. So that being said today, we're going with the foil boat. Foil boating your brisket it could not be easier. Get yourself two sheets of heavy duty aluminum foil. Plop down your beautifully hot brisket. Woo! And then you want to just fold out in every direction. Nothing to it, folks. I see a lot of people struggling with this on the internet. But you want to fold out. That way you get a really nice contact with the brisket. You don't have any sharp edges jabbing into the thing. And you want to be sure to cover anything that's feeling too crispy. You know, that's feeling a little crispy. So I might cover that up a little bit more. This back side, same deal. But it's mostly this lean side we really want to make sure we get nice and wrapped up. Looking good to me. And as I mentioned, if you fold outwards, you get these wonderful little handles to transport this thing. But that being said, back on the pit this goes until it comes up to temp around 200, 203 degrees, and then we'll pull it off. But bam 14 hours later, this brisket is coming off of the pit. And I must say, this thing is looking beautiful. You got that jiggle factor already. That bark, unbeatable. Lovely color, smells amazing, feels nice and tender. That fat is nice and rendered. You can tell just by how squishy it is that we're not going to have any unrendered fat on this thing. So to recap my five tips, one, the rub. I highly recommend using just salt and pepper with a pepper heavy rub 
That's how we're able to get this beautiful bark. It's really all you need and a great place to start. Step number two is all about your time and your temps. Hours one through four, 250, nice and smoky. From hour five until you wrap, you can bump that temp up to about 275, 300, really focusing on clean convective heat and wonderful airflow. Number three, keep it simple. You know, forget the slathers, the logs, the spritzes, the fancy ingredients, just keep it simple. Step number four, the wrap. Whether it's paper or foil or the boat, it's always a good idea to help soften up those edges, get that bark you're after, help this thing cook a little bit quicker, and make sure nothing gets overly smoked or overly dried out. And now we're on to step number five, which is the rest. I've been preaching the virtues of the long heated rest on this channel for the last two years. That's the number one way to get barbecue joint quality brisket in your home, because that's what they do at all the restaurants. You know, they'll throw these things on at eight in the morning, then around 10, 12, one o'clock, when they're finally done, they'll put them in a heating cabinet, very similar to a bread proofer, and they'll sit in there anywhere from 140 to 160 degrees until they're ready to slice into at 11 a.m. the next day. And that's great for so many reasons. First and foremost, timing. Once this goes into the warmer, you've got a five to 20 hour window where this thing is gonna be great to slice into, piping hot, ready for anyone to eat. So if you ever have to schedule a barbecue party, instead of trying to time this cook to be done at the exact specific time when your guests show up, just have it heated in the oven waiting and then you have complete freedom. Number two, a brisket is a super tough cut. It's full of connective tissue that when cooked really low and slow, the collagen in there converts into gelatin, which is what makes brisket so tender and have that wonderful mouthfeel. So by putting it in the oven overnight, you're giving that collagen extra time to convert into gelatin and get really nice and sticky and that wonderful mouthfeel that we're all looking for. And three, it's just a really foolproof way to get some amazing results. If this thing was overcooked, the overnight rest is really gonna help because all that gelatin is gonna solidify a little bit, keeping our slices together so it doesn't fall apart or shred too much. While at the same time, if it's undercooked, all that extra heated rest time is gonna help it carry over and continue to tenderize. And there are many ways to go about the overnight heated rest. You could pop this in a cooler. You could put it in your home oven at 170. That's generally the lowest temperature you're gonna get. Again, at restaurants, they have heated cabinets that go all the way down to 120 or something. I bought a toaster oven that goes all the way down to 120. And I have found that 155 degrees is the perfect temperature for a single brisket to hold overnight. But before we pop this in the oven, let's talk about how to know when your brisket is done. General rule of thumb is around 200 degrees. Let's see what this thing is reading right about now. Yep, right around 200 degrees. But the real way to know when your brisket is done is by to feel the underside. So if you lift it up and feel right in the middle of that lean, right under there where it's incredibly hot, it should feel nice and pliable, kind of like a raw brisket. That's what I tell people at the restaurant all the time. It should have some give, some flexibility, not hard, but also not shredding like pulled pork or something like that. And once it feels like that, you know this thing is in the right place. And again, that's usually around 200 and 205 degrees internal temp. So, depending on how it feels, if it is feeling too tight, you could pop it right into the oven at this stage. That way it's gonna have a longer carryover cook and continue to tenderize. Or if it's feeling really tender underneath, then you may wanna rest this down on the table for a little bit before you pop it into the oven. This one's feeling right in the middle, so I'm gonna rest this down to about 160 degrees internal temp before I pop it into my oven. Now that it's fully rested down, into my oven it goes just like this in the foil boat, top exposed on a little pan on a wire rack to make sure the bottom doesn't get toasted too hard. So in at 155 degrees this goes until tomorrow. All right, y'all, and that is it. That is my five tips for a perfect brisket cook. We covered everything from the rub to the cook schedule, techniques, the wrap, and the rest. There's really not all that much to it, but if you master all these steps, you are bound to have a brisket that you are very proud of. If you missed last week's video, be sure to check it out. That's where I go into great detail about how to trim a brisket to perfection. And be sure to tune in next week when we actually slice into this thing and talk all about plating and all that good stuff. But that being said, if you enjoyed this video, let me know by hitting that subscribe button. If you got any value out of this content at all, be sure to drop a like on this video. Leave a comment down below letting me know what you want to see me cook next. If you give any of these tips or tricks to try for yourself, be sure to tag me on Instagram at Chud's Barbecue. I'd love to see what y'all are cooking. Big shout out to all the Patreon members. Thank you for supporting Team Chud and allowing me to keep making all these videos. And until the next time I see you, please go cook something outside. Peace.